Complexity Live. This is our third round of Complexity Live. Very excited. And I'm Angie. I'm your moderator today. And beside me, I have Haley Campbell Gross. This will be a one hour live discussion. And those of us on the camera will have that discussion. And in the meantime, we will also have a live discussion, a live chat happening. So that's really exciting. Today's topic is systems change. And we're excited to jump in and start that discussion. So who's who? I'm Angie again. I'm the co-host of The Human Current, and I will be your moderator. This is Haley. Hi there, I'm Haley, and I'll be looking at the chat box during our conversation. So if you see me kind of leaning over here, I have a computer that I'm looking at everybody's questions. So feel free to chime in with anything as it comes up, whatever emerges uh, in the conversation. And Joss is our host. And Joss, would you like to give a little background to Complexity Labs? Sure. Um, if you're watching this channel, I guess you probably already know a bit about Complexity Labs. Um, we're an online for complex systems. And um, we produce a lot of educational videos um, on all topics relating to complexity and systems thinking and its application. And um, we've just been producing, actually, if you been following the channel and produce your course on systems change. Um, it's been a great course actually. It's been, it's been great to research it and put it together and it's getting published at the moment. Um, so I'm looking forward to sharing my thoughts on that with you. Excellent. Thanks, Joss. And I'll pass it over to my co-host Haley to do a little intro of what The Human Current is. So we are the co-host of The Human Current podcast. We are the complexity podcast. We talk about anything related to complex system science, systems thinking, and mostly interview style with experts in the field. We just recently went to the New England Complex Systems Institute's conference, the International Conference on Complex Systems, and um, that's a mouthful. And they had a week-long conference, which we uh, gladly participated in. And we collected 30 interviews with experts, speakers, attendees, and uh, we've been sharing those interviews uh, the past two weeks. And we've got many more to come, so uh, tune in human-current.com. Awesome. Thanks, Haley. And next, I want to pass it over to our guest. We have Dr. Orit Gal. She's a senior lecturer in, in strategy and complexity at Regents University, London. Orit, welcome, and can you give a little intro? Hi, and thank you so much for having me. Can you hear me? Is that okay? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm a lecturer uh, for strategy and complexity at Regents London. Uh, but mostly, really, I'm an expert generalist. So, I've worked in many different fields from tech startups and corporate market research to peace building NGOs and policy and military think tanks. And I guess what really connects the dots for me, you know, from all of these different places is really a fascination with how do people operating in really uncertain and volatile and dynamic environments, how do they make sense of their system? How do they understand their challenges? You know, what kind of models, what kind of tools could they use to identify leverages and opportunities? And over the years, what I've really learned is that um, the decision makers who are more complexity aware, who have a better understanding, a better grasp of the underlying dynamics, uh, have always fared better. So this is really what I've been focusing my teaching and work on. Excellent. Thank you. Thanks for being here. James Grayson, you are the founder and CEO of Blindspot Think Tank. Can you give a little intro? Hi. Um Yes, I've been interested in um, systems and uh, sustainability for about 30 years, working with it, about 15 years as a sustainability consultant, going around the world, advising companies and so on. But of course, I saw the same as everybody else was that despite all the work, the problems kept, kept getting bigger and getting worse. Um, and so at that point, I set up Blindspot Think Tank to look at why things keep getting worse despite everybody's trying harder. Uh, and systems thinking, I think, is part of the answer, but not completely, because systems thinking has been around even longer than the sustainability problems. Quite managed to uh, to prevent or to solve them. In what I call blind spotting, which is looking at what we're missing. Uh, I'm interested in new perspectives on sustainability. One of them, I, the main one I use is global security to try and draw in more of the subsystems that normally get left out. 
and I'm interested in uh, new policy responses. So for example, I've designed um, an economic tool which can implement the circular economy to make the economy design out waste rather than just produce more and more of it. So I'm um, very pleased to be here, thank you. Thanks, James. We actually had James on our podcast. I can't remember what episode number episode that was. 54. 54. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So definitely one of our one of our favorites, one of our gems. So thank you for being here on Complexity Live as thank well. You very much. And then David Ng, he's a Canadian. I am as well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Welcome, David Ng. You're a systems scientist, a business architect, and uh, management consultant and marketing scientist. Can you give another little intro? That's a uh, long, uh, long description. I've been to Toronto. I've uh, most recently been serving as a mentor um, at the um, Center for Social Innovation in Toronto. And so I'll be doing some systems change work. With them. Um, recently, I published called Open Innovation Learning. It's available open access um, uh, based off doctoral work that I've been doing at Alto University. Um, in my history, I was uh, president of the International Society for the System Sciences and 2011, 2012, and ran the conference that was in San Jose. And um, other people know me from being at IBM for 28 years, where as a management consultant and doing market development work. So I've been around for a long time. Wow, yeah, that's a long time at one place. Thank you so much for being here and sharing. Uh, Alicia Harper is a fellow at Schumacher Institute and a partner at Future Considerations. Welcome to the hum or welcome to Complexity Live. Can you share a little more about yourself? Yes. Hello. It's lovely to be here. Um, I'm a. I work as a management consultant, so I get involved in organisational development, uh, leadership work, uh, future cities work, community partnership, and I'm I'm usually the person on the team, um, the only person on the team who brings a systemic point of view to it. So I. Um, I discovered complexity science and a facilitation practice called Systemic Constellations about nine years ago or something, and they changed my world, really. But I'm a very empir empirical, my, my practice is very empirical in that it's about um, bringing what's known about how human systems flow and flourish to people in a really practical, accessible way. So most of the people I work with aren't the least bit interested in the theories. What they want is stuff that works. And, and particularly, um, quite often people have found they've exhausted the, the limits of the tools and ways of thinking that they're, not, they're used to working with, which we would call mechanistic. But you know, I, I don't hear that word outside of, outside of systems thinkers. So I'm I'm a I'm an empirical practitioner I would say very much on the ground what's practical and what lands with people who are too busy to really engage in any depth with the with the theory and the science behind it unfortunately that's great. And you're the perfect person to, for us to start our discussion with too. You know, we we talk about systems change and this live chat, this live discussion is about systems change, but just to set the groundwork in terms of what is systems change. And so, Alicia, I'd love for you to, to respond to that. How do you define systems change? And then what does the role of complexity or systems thinkers, what does that have to do with systems change? What does that bring? Well, I, if I if I answer that from the perspective of my clients, because that might bring a, that might bring a, a sort of a, a different flavor in. I very few people um, write a brief which is about systems change um, with the, the people and the consultancies I work with. Um, there's a little bit happening in the public sector and with not for profits in the UK because systems thinking has become a bit of a fad. But people don't typically understand what it means, and so they tend to write a brief which is within a much bigger mechanistic way of seeing the world. So typically, people come with a need for uh, innovation. Why aren't we innovative? How do we change our culture in some way? How do we, um, um, how do we develop better partnerships? How do we develop leaders who are more rounded? So that's what the briefs tend to be. Um, I would say for me, um, I'm very s struck by the, the quotes about 
how the world's in the process of becoming, right? It's not static, it's evolving. So the idea of creating change is a, is a, bit, a, a bit of a misnomer. But I, for me, it means understanding why things are as they are and whether what opportunities we have to change things. So can we change things? And if so, how might we encourage the sort of change that we would want to see? So I, I guess in my work, systems change is only ever used um, by the other consultants, really. And I'm sorry, just remind me of the second part of your question, Hayley. Yeah, uh, so Angie, hey, Angie, we get that all the time. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, it's one of our compliments. Um, <laughs> the second part is how, what is the role of, of being a complexity thinker or systems thinker within systems change? Well, again, I make it very, con very specific to my context. I'm, I'm normally working within um, a group of consultants or a consultancy, people who've come from uh, through, through a different heritage. So um, usually we're, we're working on actually what are our belief systems and, and how do we mesh them? So there may be people who have come from leadership development um, um, uh, consultancy and often that's about you know if we just change the individual and we just upskill the individual then they can change anything and so um, stepping in with more of a systemic view I'm able to challenge that and bring something else into the mix which of course is typically about well how is the system set up what's the history of the system how are these things creating an environment where some things can happen and other things are much more difficult. And how can we work with people in such a way to um, develop a better environment, a, a different set of conditions um, through which other things um, might, might be catalyzed? And how do we keep our eyes open for new things that might be emerging and surprising things? And all these things that we're, these concepts we're, we're interested in in complexity, but which I think a lot of organizational systems um, filter out if that makes sense they're sort of not not looking for it and of course we've got lots of examples in the world at the moment about the unlikely but not impossible having emerged and um, organizations are typically really thrown by that yeah good points thank you for that is there uh, James I'm curious just to add one more person to this this conversation sure. you do a, a lot of work and, and really focus on blind spotting and and so just in your experience, how do you define uh, systems change and how does being a systems thinker show up in that? For, for most people, it seems, it often looks to me like systems change is a way of trying to, to market the kind of management consultancy or the kind of academic research that they might have wanted to do anyway, or that anybody might have been interested to do at any point over the past 50 years. But for me, systems change is about solving the big, wicked, intractable, complex problems that have so far, you know, so far defeated us as a society. And, and ideally, if we can, not just solve one or two of them, but probably and, and possibly even more realistically aim to solve them all. And that, that will often seem to people to be totally unrealistic. You know, it's, we, we can't solve these complex problems because they're so complex. And everybody who talks about systems thinking and all the complexity experts all agree that it's much too hard and we should focus on uh, system change at a kind of subsystem level, looking at one bit or another bit. But to me, that's just reductionism dressed up as systems thinking. You know, I, I'm interested in the systems uh, the the big systems and the big problems and actually solving them and and how can we use systems thinking and complexity to do that and to to probably kind of drag us out of the herd thinking that the whole society and also the systems thinking and sustainability communities ha have been stuck in for decades yeah good point thank you for adding on to that discussion and i joss it looks like you would like to also jump in there yeah i hope my connection is okay i'm not going to break up here um so what is what is systems change i guess i'd uh kind of bring a more theoretical approach to it because i'm teaching it um i'd say systems change taking it from systems thinking is about it's about the whole. It's about changing the whole system instead of the parts. Um, 
So that's, I think that's very different to what, to what we normally do is really focus on parts, right? So um, even when there's a problem with the whole system, we quite often kind of trace that, try and trace that back to some specific part within the system. Um, because we're not very good at looking at whole systems and dealing with problems that are very kind of distributed and complex. So it, the system may have kind of a systemic problem, but we can't deal with that. So we kind of trace it back to some individual part. And then we kind of focus all our resources on, on tackling that specific problem. Um, so like if there's a problem with housing, we'll kind of get a bunch of we'll, we'll set up a commission or something we'll get a whole pile of people together and we'll we'll put someone in charge at the top and give them a pile of money and a pile of authority and tell them to go and tackle that problem and when they don't solve it we'll kind of we'll kind of blame them and that's in a way that's kind of the totally the wrong way to tackle a kind of a systemic problem because actually a systemic problem is by definition it's spread out throughout the system right in systems change we're dealing with these wicked problems these complex wicked problems which is systemic which means that it's not actually one part of the system that has the problem it's the whole system it's the way the parts individually are acting and interacting that creates that emergent outcome so like a simpler problem would be the simpler problems you can isolate them and you can kind of define them and then you can go and tackle them in a linear fashion so if you have a car and it has a puncher then you can just see it has a puncher you go and fix the puncher and the car works and that that's very simple a systemic problem like climate change is not like that right the problem with climate change is that we're all it's 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 a tragedy of the commons common externalities and emergence from externalities so like each of us are incentivized to a certain way to go and drive our car because the cost of doing that is externalized to the whole system right and that creates an emergent an emergent critical state in the whole system so it's, a, it's it's actually the problem is kind of distributed out in the whole system it's each one of us that are creating that that overall track overall overall structure that overall emergent outcome and in that case you can't focus on one part there isn't one part to go and tackle in a linear fashion you actually have to kind of create a solution, create a platform, create an environment that affects the system in many different locations. Um, and you create, it's really about, because it's about emergence, because the problem is an emergent outcome, right? Like inequality, that's kind of an emergent outcome. It's not one person, you know, there might be conspiracy theories, but it's not one person who's creating all this kind of gross inequality. It's actually the way we all kind of act, the way we're incentivized to act that creates that problem. And you actually have to, kind of create a dispersed um, platform that changes the way people act and interact. I mean, like bribery is another good example of an emergent outcome, emergent, you know, wicked problem because it's all of the actors in the system, right? It's not one person. And it's, it's the way they have to kind of create a kind of a platform and tackle that in a district. You almost have to create a new narrative, a new way um, for the parts to kind of understand themselves and the way they interact so as you get a new emergent outcome that solves the problem so i mean i guess that's the main thing but it's it's a systems problem so you can't tackle it in kind of a linear fashion solving one part you have to have a kind of distributed approach to dealing with it thanks for adding that joss our discussion board is um is really exciting over here and so i want to actually Take it back to David Ng. So you in the discussion board uh, asked making a distinction between systemic and and systematic change. And I thought that was an interesting question. David. Yeah, so we have to be a little careful with language often when we get in, around systems. And so uh, the first thing that I would ask people to think about is when they're talking about systems change, is that systems plural or system singular? And people often don't think about having multiple holes at the same time, that when you're changing a system, that you're actually changing multiple things. So uh, as an example, if you're thinking about changing the uh, climate system, there could be an economic system that also is there happening at the same time. So when you're doing that, you end up with a question about whether there's systemic change, which is a hole or multiple holes, and people sometimes confuse that with being systematic, which would be to plan out some activities and do them in a sequence, or even have a learning procedure where you would do things in a sequence. Um, systematic may or may not be systemic, and so people may be confused at that. 
Thank you for that clarification. Uh, I, yeah, I thought that was really interesting when you put that on the board. And I was also thinking as people were talking about systems change about how often we often think of systems change as something we're doing to that system, but we are part of all those systems. And so what's our role in that as well and facilitating that. So uh, that's something I that popped into my head as, as we we're all sharing. I wanna pass it over uh, to or it, and then we'll go to James, and then I've got some more specific questions uh, to move the conversation forward. So, or it. Yes. Uh, so, just two points to kind of add to that interesting discussion. Uh, first of all, systems change all the time, they change naturally. Uh, so it's important to remember that even the most intractable problem you think you're dealing with inevitably is not permanent. I kind of like to think of them as these great hurricanes. Uh, you know, at some point they will run out of momentum of energy sources or they will hit land. So uh, the actual sources for change are already embedded within the system, which is why I like uh, to spend a lot of time understanding the internal contradictions and tensions that are building up in whatever system I'm, I'm trying to analyze or approach. But having said that, it's also really important to remember that at the end of the day, the systems, whatever problem that we're trying to deal with, makes sense, it works, and it works for a lot of the people that are involved. It has some kind of a political, economic, technological, and cultural coherency. Uh, so in that sense, uh, it costs and it is painful to create that change and, and people will get hurt even if like in peace building, you know that at the end of the day, they will be better off. And this is really important to think about because actually system change is also destruction. Uh, we're destroying patterns, we're destroying relations, we're destroying uh, resource flows, we're destroying incentive structures. Um, and, and we need to be aware of that, not just morally, but also because as we start to operate, actually there will be an opposition system that will naturally emerge to counter whatever we're trying to do. And some of it will not even relate directly to us. It might relate to, again, unintended consequences down the line of whatever we're trying to do, other connected systems, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So it's very important to think about the dynamics of action through system change as well. Uh, yes, yeah, so important to also think about that opposition that will come into play and change is uncomfortable. Yeah, so there's going to be some of that. Thank you for that point. And William Bridges uh, comes to mind with his book on transition and thinking about how tra change um, triggers an emotional transition and uh, and how we show up in that. So thank you for that. Uh, I, I'm going to pass it over to, to James for a second and then move the discussion to our next question. Uh, but James, I want to pass it over to you because you, you mentioned in the, the chat box around linear uh, features and opportunities. And so I just want to pass it over to you and then we will uh, move on to our next question. I, I, it was just a little point, little quick point really that I think that the, the key with systems change in particular when we've got these immense uh, global acute problems like climate and a whole bunch of other things is that we need to be thinking about solving them quickly. So we need to be particularly interested in the system change methods, which can give us an abrupt shift from one paradigm or one system state to another. And uh, so we, we need to be careful in our own thinking and watching our own thinking that we're not talking ourselves out of the biggest, fastest opportunities. Uh, and, and those big, fast change opportunities, uh, to me, often look linear. So it's actually about relatively simple things that can be done to complex systems. So although the systems are complex and have incredibly complicated nonlinear features, the change processes can in many instances be relatively straightforward and things that could be done or could have been done at any point in the past decades. But because they aren't quite the thing that we're looking for, they get overlooked again and again. So we just need to be careful not to un, unintentionally talk ourselves out of uh, being able to solve the problems that the systems thinking community is actually here for. 
Uh, yes, don't talk ourselves out of it. So important because it feels sometimes like we're being defeated in that. So thank you for that, James. I want to uh, shift a little bit. And for this next question, I'd love to uh, address this to David Ng. And, and for those that want to chime in afterwards, let me know. David, compared to the last century, what changes should systems thinkers be more concerned about? What do you think? Ah, that's a great question. It's a lot to um, the work that I was doing in the International Society for the System Sciences when I was president in 2011 and 2012. Uh, a lot of the system thinking uh, readings tend to date back to the 1980s, which is actually uh, pre-internet if people want it, that context. And so they might have thought the internet would uh, come out someday, but they weren't living in a world that was global and all connected. Um, so my focus during the ISSS presidency was specifically on uh, what's new in the 21st century. And the two issues that I brought up that have changed things are uh, one, uh, service economy, and two, uh, the Anthropocene happening. Um, so first on the service economy, we've moved from a world where in effect, um, it's, it's an issue of, of supply versus demand. It used to be that manufacturing used to be a problem this world now where there are lots of products and services available. And so people haven't thought about quite often that, um, that they're in a service economy and that they need to change the way they work with that. Uh, there's always alternatives to the products or services that you have today, and that changes the way that um, companies and individuals should work. Uh, the second one is the Anthropocene, uh, which is um, in, in the earth science, the, the fact that we moved from um, the Holocene where human beings um, uh, now influence the climate. Because uh, up to this point at which the, uh, the books on the Anthropocene came out, it was kind of believed that the climate is part of the environment, that we can uh, do things in the world. And then um, in the 2000s, in the first decade, there was a lot of work and research in resilient science. And in resilient science, they look at things like collapse. Um, and so uh, we need to be concerned a little bit more about systems that collapse and reform and how that happens. Yeah, those are big topic areas. I feel like we could have entire live discussions just based on those different areas. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, I, and actually, uh, James, uh, in his pod when we interviewed James Grayson, we talked a lot about Anthropocene. It was it was really interesting and, and a lot that we didn't know before we even having that interview. Thank you, David. Uh, Joss, do you want to add in, add on to this? Is Joss frozen? Joss is frozen. Oh, there he is. Hi, can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, cool. Um, what's changed? I think I think a lot of things have actually changed in the past 20, 30 years. Um, definitely globalization, not connectivity. Alexity, really, I think that's the biggest thing. Uh, um, and I think now, um, kind of point to why we need to change. I think if you see years ago, it wasn't very easy to kind of convince thing, convince people, particularly like in the mainstream, that we kind of had to change, that, that things like, like sustainability were important. And now it's uh, so collective about how fast the world's changing and how many issues we do have. And I think it's a lot about kind of feed feedback. It's not so easy and kind of that we have greater interdependency, I don't think it's so easy to kind of push problems beyond the boundary anymore. In problems, you know, we used to live in a kind of nationalized world where we could kind of, you know, project our problems onto another nation or another side of the world or with the environment, you know, project our waste wherever it wasn't anymore. And I think people are more aware of that. And when you kind of, are able to show those problems to people, then you're able to kind of demonstrate that we do need to change. And I think then there's opportunity for getting some kind of change in the system. Um, so, I mean, going back to what Arut was saying um, about change being a natural thing, I think that's totally true. I think that's particularly true in systems change because I think in systems change, you can't actually change a system. Like, I think you can change the parts in a system, right? You can go 
learn fix your car or whatever whatever the whole very complex system like i think that's almost impossible what you can do as Orit was saying is work with the potential in the system as david um as david uh i've got so there are certain contradictions in the system and you can use those to evolve it as it's evolving in certain directions to assist it to evolve in certain directions as opposed to other ones sorry am i freezing up again or? yeah yeah it's pretty glitchy there i think we yeah. got we were able to piece together sorry the words <laughs> thank you joss hey Haley, how's our discussion going do we have any uh, anything to add from our chat yeah. discussion yeah there is a question um we could present to the group from uh jimbo jones and he says, uh, what are the pitfalls or limitations of framing? So I'm not sure if uh, there's a specific person wants to jump in on that one or. Yeah, how about, James, I wonder if you would, would you like to jump in on that, that question? And, uh, and then also maybe you can add in your point of uh, the whole point of system changes to change, not just the parts. <laughs> okay, uh, sure. I'm, I'm not quite sure what the, the aim of the question was with framing, but one of the core questions, one of the core framing issues with system change is, is what is the system that you want to change? And, and how ambitious should we be about the, le the level or the frame of the system, system that we're aiming for? And the traditional environmentalist or management consultant or organization will be looking um, almost, almost always at just at subsystems the subsystem of the organization or the subsystem of the waste management at a particular depot uh, or you know the design of a particular product and whether it's going to become waste or not. I, I think with system change what's interesting is to look at the, the system in terms of the systemic problem which is not just the waste in, a, in one company say or you know the conflict in one area but but you know the prevalence of conflict globally and and what that's doing to our uh, you know our humanity and our economies and uh, you know the the patterns of making waste or not making or not not making resources globally and how we can change those entire patterns and actually not just dabbling with it not just doing it at a subsystem at a time incrementally or in, in evolutionary terms or in terms of what we think we can manage as individuals or in, within our organizations but really genuinely being ambitious enough with the framing to actually talk about solving the problem as a whole you know what would it mean to design out waste everywhere what would it mean to operate as a civilization um, without the need for nuclear weapons or spending the kind of quantities of tens of trillions of dollars that we do on on weapon spending you know and and all of the other uh, interrelated problems at that scale uh, you know I, I would aim the framing big and aim the thinking big uh, and and our ambition big and you know and when it when that seems uncomfortable or impossible or doesn't match the kind of theory that we're that we're used to discussing then just you know just go 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 through the discomfort and change the theory and, and keep working until we actually are really solving the problems yeah good point and uh and we'll talk more about blind spotting uh shortly and i, I think that that also fits in there as well and so i uh, thank you for our, our chat going on and, and adding to our discussion and uh Alicia, you have uh, something you want to add? Do you have a, do you want to jump in here? Uh, yeah, I would just say that I think the it's a brilliant question because I think the framing is really critical. And often um, when we're working uh, with with people in consultancy, um, we we will often challenge even the framing so that the brief can be uh, we can be changing the brief in consultation with the client from the beginning because what we want to uh, what we want to make sure is that um we understand uh that we can set off on the right path and we're not just going to um we're ju not just going to hunt down the problem so often of course we know that how something shows up in a system may be in a different place and may take a completely different flavor to the the sort of source of it or where we can intervene so i think that it's really important to uh, question the framing and to continually question it and behind the scenes we're 
often always really questioning what are my assumptions about what we're doing here? What are my beliefs and how are those flowing through into the work we're doing? So there's a real, I, I think there's a real level of awareness about how are you framing the problem and the potential for what you might then do, but also how does that work on the inside as well as on, on the outside, if that makes sense. And I think Orit's point about ethics is really important. I think the ethics comes into the, the framing as well. Yeah, that's a great point. And such a systems thinking lens uh, to put on that and, and how you show up and all that. Uh, thank you for that. And speaking of Orit, Orit, would you like to jump in and in this discussion here? Yeah, perhaps just one more point in terms of framing. Another aspect that is really important is that the framing itself also needs to consider who is the person who does the framing. Because at the end of the day, uh, we can uh, tackle different big problems. And, and again, the framing itself will be as big as needed and will be multidimensional and taking so many different trends and elements, but it needs, to, in order for it not to be an academic exercise, it needs to be done from the perspective of whatever chain agent you are. So, for example, my PhD was about the World Bank and their evolution of development doctrines, but their view of the international system for the same problem would have looked completely different from the one of the IMF, even if they were overlapping. So the framing itself, um, it, it's not like a bird's eye view. There's no such thing really as the system. It is a way for you to make sense out of reality. And you need to embed yourself in that. So your own constraints, capabilities, uh, connections, etc., are all part of that initial modeling. So it's important to consider that as well. Yeah, a very important consideration as well. Thank you so much for that. I, I want to shift a little bit. I mentioned blind spotting a couple times now, and I haven't really given much context for that. And so, and James, that term has really uh, come up uh, in your work, and and you've coined that. And and I think that that also fits in with framing too. Uh, so, James Grayson, what is blind spotting, and and how can blind spotting help us work towards uh, systemic change? Blind spotting is the, an activity you can do yourself or with a group of people where you're deliberately assuming that the way that we're thinking about something or the kinds of solutions that we typically come up with are, are not sufficient. Even if it feels like we're in a transition which is a progress towards uh, a better world or a better organization, we can Use a, use a kind of uh, thinking experiment to, with ourselves to say, well, what if that isn't enough? And what if we're missing something here? And that, that's the blind spotting, looking for what it is that we're missing. And uh, I, guess, I guess the one way of trying to frame the blind spotting is that where you've got a really big intractable, intractable problem, then you can say, oh, well, the problem's just too complex, it's too hard, there are too many obstacles, we just can't solve it. Or you can say, well, we must be missing something on the scale of the problem. Our blind spots must be that big that we're able to go on day after day, decade after decade, not solving this problem. And what is it that we're missing? And if that means kind of challenging ourselves and coming up with new solutions or um, you know, working in new ways, then that's what we need to try to do. And, and that blind spotting process can be the, the motivation to try and get us to that new position where we're able to actually solve the things that previously we couldn't solve. Thank you, James. And you've used blind spotting. I mean, you use blind spotting all the time. It's I think it's part of your wiring and, and how you do your work and how you, you live out your best self. And can you give some examples of how you've applied blind spotting? Um, I guess it's something that you, you can see at different levels. Um, I mean, at a, at a very practical scale, I, I started 30 years, years ago working on waste and composting, and one of the things that I was interested in was that throughout the whole UK, almost all the local authorities were, um, were, were trying to persuade everybody to use these Dalek-style plastic cone-shaped composting systems. And, and they, were, they were really easy to use. So you hardly had to think about what you were doing when you used one of these things. You could put almost anything in and, they, and it would disappear. 
But what I found about it was that they were actually it was working on anaerobic bacteria generating methane, uh, and it, it wasn't giving you the um, the compost that you wanted. It was actually a kind of a, a climate and uh, climate destruction machine producing greenhouse ga greenhouse gases like mad, and and so what I was interested in is how you know how you can switch mindsets out of thinking what's the most easy easy technical solution that you can come up with that gives the illusion of solving the problem to actually investing our thought in challenging how we normally do in, you know developing uh, aerobic systems uh, and and i invented this thing which i call grass manure which is a way of making a kind of horse manure out of grass clippings but you can do the kind of the same blind spotting kind of process on policy questions. You know, uh, for example, I designed an economic tool which, which uh, looked at what it is that we're missing every time when we try and handle waste issues. You know, for example, waste management is dealing with waste after it's created, when actually what we need to be doing is managing waste before it's created, at the design stage and in the price incentives and so on. Uh, and that's not difficult to do. You just can't do it the way we always have been doing it in the past. And the same with sustainability as an overall concept. It's so easy for it to get pigeonholed into a kind of um, green niche when actually what we need to be doing is tying it together with economic stability, uh, financial stability, uh, um, managing conflict internationally in between countries. And that's where I thought it was more useful to actually have a, a global security framing that encompasses a wider range of questions that then you can look at a problem solving method for dealing with the whole complex system of all of these problems together which ironically i think become easier to solve as when you deal with the larger more whole system so there's just a few examples on different scales yeah, thank you for those examples. It makes me think of Anthropocene, and David, you mentioned um, Anthropocene earlier. Would you like to chime in here? I'm, I'm curious how, how you see blind, uh, blind spotting show up, whether it be with Anthropocene or, or perhaps your work with IBM or uh, the International Society of Systems uh, Sciences or other areas of your work? Um, sure. So this whole discussion reminds me of uh, research that was done um, at the University of Arizona College of Medicine on what's called the map of ignorance. Um, when doc they're trained to be certain uh, because uh, when, a doc, when you, a doctor has to say, you've got cancer, the first question that always comes back is, are you sure? And the answer has to be, the doctor has to say, yes, I'm actually sure because I wouldn't give you that diagnosis and uh, otherwise it causes problems. But doctors need to appreciate that science doesn't have all the answers. So they created this, um, this college and it's a, a program where they go through um, different types of knowledge and knowing. And um, the one that's the most obvious is known knowns where we know what we know. Uh, you have unknown knowns uh, where, uh, it, you know, so uh, we don't think about maybe that we know how to swim, but all of a sudden you get thrown under water, it says, oh yes, I remember how to swim. Um, there's issues and the famous unknown unknowns which are things that uh, actually uh, you don't know you don't know. And this is where people tend to be very blind, is that they don't know they don't know. Um, now, the, the, the actual one that is really helpful is known unknowns, because if someone tells you you don't know, it becomes a known unknown. And the advantage of having a known unknown is that you can actually do research and learn from it. Um, the, the, there are things, however, like taboos that you can't actually discuss, and that gets in the ways and denials. And so my favorite example of that is, is Chinese medicine, traditional Chinese medicine. So you go to a Western um, board that is certifying physicians, and you say, okay, um, can we certify traditional Chinese medicine? Well, we don't believe in Chinese medicine. Okay, that means you're not going to certify them, and so they should certify themselves. Oh, no, we, you know, so you get caught in this trap where it's a known unknown, and they're trying to figure out how to deal with it. So a lot of this discussion on blind spotting uh, strikes me as being in that same sort of theme. I was taking some notes. I thought that was uh, yeah an interesting uh, an interesting lens around you know what you know you don't know what you know and then the yeah all the notes <laughs> all those things. <laughs> Thanks for jumping in on that, David. Uh, Alicia, you do you want to mention anything about um, the use of the participative, participative uh, process? 
Well, yes, I don't use the term blind spotting, but actually it, um, we, um, it's why we use participative processes when we're working with social systems, because it's a recognition that um, it is the unknown unknowns, you know, and, and so often um, the work we're doing takes us into areas that have to do with social justice and, uh, and questions of equality and questions of who has power and what are the dominant stories and who gets to set the agenda and all of this sort of stuff. And so we use participative processes, which mean actually as far as you are able, involving people directly who sit in different parts of the system so that we don't just have a, well, I went to interview them because that's still viewing, it's still applying a filter, right? It's I'm asking questions that are questions that emerge from through my lens. Um, and so um, I, I think there's something really important there, which takes us back into this question about framing. And it takes us back into the question about ethics, because um, there are always areas of discomfort and areas where clients won't go. And for us as consultants, it's a very live question about um, whether we are whether the work we're doing is is colluding with something that actually we feel ethically we want to change. So there's always this live question about the framing, the scope, um, and and whether we are doing more good than we might be doing to cement something that we'd want to change. Uh, yes, very important question to be uh, asking ourselves that. And uh, I, you know, I think about uh, change and, and system change, and, and it definitely involves some disruption or nudging the system. And there's this quote by uh, Jeff Lawrence, which states, there's no such thing as a dysfunctional organization because every organization is perfectly aligned to achieve the results it gets. And so, Orit, I'd love to bring you into this conversation around that quote. Start If you start off this uh, discussion around that quote, I'm curious, as a participating member of a social system, how can we disrupt or nudge a social system to help it recognize itself? Well, I, I completely agree with that quote because, uh, again, systems emerge over time and they evolve and, and, and they make sense. This is why they evolved the way they did. And actually, many times they evolve as a solution to a problem. But over time, because there are other elements in the environment that changes, you have drift and they become actually problems rather than the initial solutions that they they evolve to become as an innovative process uh, but at the end of the day we change systems in anything we do uh, because they're alive and they're dynamic so whatever we do inside a system either enhances or undermines an existing pattern uh, so once you're aware of that and once you become more aware of the patterns that are around you uh, you can intentionally think about disrupting or uh, enhancing them. Uh, but that also means that a lot of system changes in retrospect were unintentional. I mean, uh, think even about Kim Kardashian. Uh, she's a system changer, right? Uh, she changed different elements in terms of, uh, I don't know, female beauty and business of advertising, whatever. But I doubt if there was an intentional system change strategy behind it. Uh, so a lot of the change that we see happening in system is because people are actually trying to better their position within a system, but through whatever they're doing, they are creating change. And for others who want to disrupt the system, actually identifying that uh, can be a great tool because this is where you can find your opportunities. And in that sense, uh, it's really important to remember that we all operate from within a system. No one operates at the systemic level. We can try to analyze things uh, intellectually at the systemic level, but we all operate from the inside, uh, inevitably, because you need to interact and exchange things with other people around you to implement anything. So that's part of it. Uh, such a good point, or and such a good thing, a good reminder for us to understand that we show up individually as as agency with agency in those systems. And uh, and so thanks for that and the reminder. And I wonder, uh, David, did you want to add anything to this conversation and the quote? And I'll just say the quote one more time by Jeff Lawrence. There's no such thing as a dysfunctional organization because every organization is perfectly aligned to achieve the results it gets. Um, actually, there, there's interesting um, statement by Stafford Beer that the purpose of a system is what it does. 
Um, and so uh, this drift between what you talk about in terms of um, uh, intention when you're talking about dysfunctional, because dysfunctional, uh, if we go back to the, the definition of uh, a function, function is contribution of the part to the whole. And so you run into the issue of dysfunction being something where there's a change. It's, it can either be in the change in the part that doesn't match the whole, or it changes in the whole and doesn't match the part, right? So um, dysfunction is an interesting question. Uh, but this reminds me of the uh, the classic 1965 article um, by uh, Fred Emery and, Ed, and uh, Eric Trist on turbulent environments, um, causal texture of organizational environments. And what they look at is, uh, is how uh, change happens and uh, the change in terms of the environment. So they have, uh, as an example, a placid environment where the environment doesn't change and then everything is fine. Um, there's four types, but the most extreme is what they call the turbulent environment, where in effect the, the outside world is changing so quickly that you have problems managing and, uh, and having to coordinate to work together. So, um, it's, so when you talk about change, it's not just change internally, but it's also change in the external world and trying to line those two things up. It sounds it sounds uh, simple, right? <laughs> yeah, that's a lot of work. That's that's great. Thank you. And uh, Leisha, you, I wonder if you'd like to to. Or sorry, I'm I'm going to pass it over to Joss first. Okay. Hopefully, I won't break up. Um, I'm thinking of what you're saying. There is evolution. I mean, I think complex systems. Um, they don't just change by someone kind of saying they're going to change, you know, like planning it out. They change to evolution, a company, a society. That's, that's evolution, how that whole system changes. And it's about responding to that. Parts have to, they adapt and they evolve. There's co-evolution, they evolve together. And you only really survive if that to the rest of the systems. Um, and I think, yes, yeah, systems change only really happens when the environment changes, holds on to that. And I think part of enabling that evolution is actually just kind of exposing the uh, system to its environment. It's kind of showing that you're living in a different environment. You're Living in certain sense you did in the past are no longer working. So, am I am I breaking up? Yeah, it's really hard to get what you're saying. It's very uh, yeah crazy. I'm so sorry, okay. Jazz. <laughs> um, yeah, no worries. Yeah, that's too bad when we don't have the the good connections. Uh, so, just for the sake of time, and uh, we're going to wrap up shortly. But Alicia, or Alicia, would you like to uh, add on? I'm slow. I'm I'm connecting to something that Orit said last time. She That's spoke. All right. I just said um, for me, actually, um, it, it takes us into that realm of how how we are on the inside, and then developing greater self awareness. And because that does show itself um, in the way that we act, and we're not always aware of the difference between what we think we think and and how we act. And I I find that that. Um, uh, uh, works its way into the work all the time. So as an example, um, someone who was a participant in an organizational change program said afterwards, um, it's really strange, we're all so much kinder to each other and it's completely changed my experience of work. And that's very typical, that wasn't, that wasn't the objective of the work, it wasn't the stated objective, but something happens, uh, we seem to bring in greater humanity it seems to be really intrinsic to doing this work so i think there's it's maybe the topic for another another webcast but there is something about our embodied um our, how we are embodied in this work and our state of being and how important that is and and how that affects the system um which yes which i i would say is really interesting yes thank you and this brings us to our last kind of comments, our, our reflections. And I know that there's more uh, more insight that people want to share. And so I just want to take a moment to uh, go around and see if anyone has any last thoughts. And then we'll follow that with a, a round of if there's anything uh, 
coming out in our work that we should be um, recognizing. So, uh, James, I'll pass it over to you first. Uh, any closing thoughts? Uh, I guess just to say that we should um, continue to challenge our own thinking on what on system theory and systems change. If we think, for example, that systems uh, can only change slowly or that we can only create system change at a, a modest scale of some kind, then we need to keep thinking because system change doesn't have to be just evolu evolutionary. It actually does have to be quick and abrupt and it can be and there are ways to do that. I mean, I'll, I'll put in the chat box uh, the paper that was published by NATO uh, that I wrote on how you could do that, which is a, a kind of a whole system approach to multiple problem solving. Um, and what, what we end up doing, I think, often when we're uh, dealing with environmental issues or system change is managing our own psychology, uh, avoiding the discomfort of dealing, thinking about problems that are too big or too overwhelming. And if we, if we can be aware of that psychology in ourselves, that we're responding in that way, then perhaps we can work through it. You know, we, we can be more ambitious about system change. We can take on bigger problems and we can actually start to solve them, which is what the, the movement and the system thinking community have, 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 should have been able to do over the recent decades. So thank you for having me on. Thank you, James. And just uh, just to come back to you, is there any uh, work that any announcements or anything that you'd like to share? Um, I mean, I'd I'd love to stay in touch with anybody who's watching this. You know, um, let me know what you're thinking of this this uh, this chat uh, on Twitter. I'm at Blind Spotting on Twitter. So you know, come and say hello and let me know your your ideas on system change, everybody. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, James. Uh, or it would you? What are your final thoughts, reflections, uh, comments, and then and then lastly, uh, is there any announcements you'd like to share, or anything that you'd like to uh, close out with? Thank you. Uh, just uh, going back to a few things that Alicia said earlier about the importance of practitioners and the agency we actually have in ourselves. I think that intuitively in our personal lives, we all do system change and you know to think about how you manage your love life your children uh your relationships we are all so intuitively adapt to thinking about dynamics and thinking about what patterns you're trying to enhance or disrupt uh and and i think it's it's really interesting how do you transition that into your professional life as well so um that's kind of important because we do have that agency and that uh approach within us i think naturally um i've been working uh, mainly over the last two years on thinking about uh what can we learn from other times or periods in history where people actually had better tools to think about complexity so i mean obviously the world has always been complex uh, and i found great inspiration in traditional chinese strategic thought and and also chinese medicine which has been uh, mentioned here by david as well so for anyone who's interested you can look it up on social acupuncture.co.uk uh, for some of my writing on this and I'd love to carry on that conversation with anybody who's watching and you guys as well of course thank, thank you for you. having me again yeah thank you so much we'll definitely be checking out your work even more we did do a little bit of cyber stalking already and <laughs> thank you so much for being on Alicia would you like to do you have any closing reflections thoughts and uh, anything you'd like to announce Yes, I'm, I'm just sort of um, noticing what happens for me in my body when I hear James talk about us needing to do things on a, on a big scale. And it, uh, it brings up real panic and a real sense, I can't do that. Um, I wanted to share a, a quote from Jean Bolton, which I really loved. Um, she talks about the causes of change being uh, small, quirky and local. And it really settles my anxiety because I think, I'm small, quirky, and local, but there is there is something uh, really practical about um, developing a, a sort of a curiosity about where do I have the appetite and the agency and the permission to, to make an intervention? Where is that? So where where can I? How can I do something really practical? And just being in a state of curiosity, which I think for me personally prevents me being overwhelmed by the the scale of the task. So I would I would I would offer that.
And there's some great systems games that I'm sure we've all played where you actually have an embodied um, experience of how you in a system can can bring about change even if even if you're weighted to be a, a sort of less a, a less powerful uh, node in it so um i think i think um, i would just offer you know seek out those those opportunities to experience the agency that you that you do have and connect with other people there, there are really so few of us who think this way i think and i think uh, sort of joining joining us up and sharing our experiences is really important. Thank you for that. That's excellent. And I just want to say, uh, James actually put in the comment box here that curiosity is a super antidote for feeling overwhelmed. And I would say curiosity is also an antidote for judgment as well. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. I love that. And and Jean Bolton, we had her on the show, which is oh, such Jean a treat. Bolton. Yes. It's yeah, an amazing person. I, I know I recognize the time. We have a few. I just we'll just go a little couple more minutes here. I want to pass it over to David. Ing, do you have any closing comments, reflections, anything you'd like to share or announce? Um, systems is a pretty big domain, so there's a lot of ongoing research. And so I have three uh, places I could point people, uh, actually more than three, but um, a lot of the work I do is based with the International Society for the System Sciences. Um, and as part of that, I had worked uh, also in COSI, the International Council on it. Together, they formed a group called the System Science Working Group. And uh, there's been a wiki that's been running years now. I don't know. It's been a long time since we've run this. Uh, and uh, research trying to bridge the system sciences and systems engineering. Um, the second one is for people who just want to go online. Um, I have a, a partnership with uh, Benjamin Taylor in the UK, who's been on this uh, series before. Um, uh, and it's uh, the Systems Community of Inquiry. And um, it's a, a site where we post a lot of content. Um, and uh, that's actually how I discovered uh, Human Current and also Complexity Labs, because Benjamin had, uh, had put them up there. And so uh, people can join up and um, or they can just read it as a blog, whatever. Uh, but it's coi.com. Um, the third one is if people are around Toronto, uh, we have System Thinking Ontario, which is a group that meets uh, every third Wednesday currently. Uh, because uh, we had this challenge where we had these members, the International Society for the System Sciences, that would be meeting everywhere except for Toronto. And I can bike to Elena's house from my place. So uh, it's pretty funny meeting her in Austria and the UK and not meeting her in Toronto. So we started this group that's a very regular thing. Uh, I'm easy to find on the web, people looking for me. I, uh, I blog at coevolving.com and on Twitter, I'm uh, at David Ng. Thank you, David, for that. I also want to make a comment of uh, Alicia. Alicia uh, made a made a comment here in the chat box. That I just want to share that people can find her and via future considerations or on Twitter at systemic underscore uh, arts. Arts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry, I dropped down there. Um, and that, uh, and we definitely suggest that you check that out and join uh, the Schumacher Institute as well. So thank you for that. And Joss is having um, some. That connection is not that great. So uh, we'll uh, you'll just smile and nod <laughs> and uh, <laughs> instead of pass it. Thank you so much. I want to. Um, Pass it over to my co-host here. How is the chat going? Do you have any final reflections? There's actually been some really great conversations between chat members, which was really fun to watch uh, people chatting with each other. Um, and we addressed some of the questions when talking about our own changing ourselves um, and how we are, in fact, a system and, and what that kind of plays into this whole conversation of system change. So I'm really glad that that actually organically came up in the conversation. Um, and I think that that's a huge element and something that I've learned a lot about, especially doing the podcast for three years, that we, the change starts within us, really. It, it starts there and then we uh, ripple out into the systems we're a part of. So thank you, ladies. Thank you, David, everyone that uh, talked with us on that. It's been an incredibly enriching conversation. As far as what's coming up for the human currents, we um, are releasing episodes uh, very, very frequently right now because of the conference where we collected uh, interviews from the International Conference on Complex Systems. So uh, really excited to release Stephen Wolfram in the next week or two, maybe two mm -hmm. weeks. Um, so that's gonna be an amazing conversation to share. It's 45 minutes long and very enriching um, to hear about his past and how he came into the complexity realm. And then we have several others lined up after that 
um, including Gad Sad. His uh, identity online is the Gad Father. Uh, and then we also have like Simon Dedeo and some other amazing uh, speakers coming up. So really excited to share those with our listeners. You can find us at human-current.com, wherever you get your podcasts, and we're at Twitter at Let's Work Happy. Thanks, Haley. Yeah. Uh, in, in wrapping up, I want to thank our guests. Uh, really appreciate your insight, your wisdom, uh, your time and energy for being here. What a rich discussion. I wish we had a bunch more hours. And so thank, thank you to each of you. And thank you, Joss. This has been an awesome collaboration between the Human Current and Complexity Labs. It's just been so much fun and, and fascinating. Our, the next Complexity Live will happen on September 14th at 6 p.m. GMT, which is for those of us in North America, that is 1 p.m. Central Standard Time. And uh, if you have any questions or need more information about that, you can log on either to Complexity Labs or onto human-current.com. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for those that joined the live discussion as well. And we're looking forward to the next Complexity Labs live. Complexity live. Thank, thank you.